started in just a moment. Alright everybody, we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. So good evening everybody and welcome back to Walks and Wall Street. Today is Wednesday, thank God. Tomorrow is Thursday, almost the end of the week already. And yesterday we had some technical difficulties, so I apologize for that. Let's actually open up the umbrella here because it just started raining. Uh, but now we are going to be back on track. For those of you who are new here, because we do have quite a few new viewers to the audience, we usually do these live streams every single day, starting at around 8.30, 8.45. Sometimes we're late, sometimes we're not. Um, Monday through Friday, we cover all of the major breaking headlines in the financial markets. Saturdays is kind of the day to take off. We explore new neighborhoods in New York City and have a good time. Uh, and on Sundays, we do the Markets A Look Ahead live stream. Now, this week is going to be very action-packed with earnings. We already talked about some of the notable companies that we're reporting uh, as we head into the thick of earnings season. Now, as we know, earnings season always starts off with the major financial players reporting earnings, such as the major investment banks and the like. And things have pretty much been positive. Now, there have been some... I would say negative aspects of earnings season, which we will talk about. We briefly spoke about it last night, but I'm not too sure anybody heard it because we were having some technical difficulties. But in general, if we had to summarize uh, the start of this earnings season, particularly with major investment banks, it's that a deal making, uh, I should say deal making in general on Wall Street is picking up in a major way. JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America all reporting materially higher investment banking revenue, such as the advisory fees, investment banking fees, and the like. Uh, that just goes to show that the MA markets uh, are opening up. You have the IPO markets starting to open up again, and deals are starting to get done. So, big earnings recovery there. Uh, another sell-off in the markets today, S&P 500 was down yet again. We are now trading back below the 200, or excuse me, the 50-day moving average on the S&P 500. The VIX caught a little bit of a bid again as we enter volatility here. We'll go ahead and get started. We are currently reporting live outside of the beautiful Moynihan train hall, where you can get the Long Island Railroad and the Amtrak, and we have this spectacular view of not only the Empire, but we'll kick the stream off. Quick reminder here, everybody. Uh, I did send out all of our equity research for free to all of our Walks and Wall Street subscribers. If you would like to receive all of our market thoughts, just go ahead and scan the QR code on the screen uh, punch in your email and you will be subscribed to our Behind the Street newsletter. Uh, we did send that out on Thursday. We talked a lot about commodities, uh, particularly uh, crude oil. 
Uh, and we talked about inflation. All right, let me go ahead and uh, let's do this. All right, I see Jafet Perez, Gary Carpenter. Always a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. DC322, Dutchman is here. Uh, Dario, what's going on? Jafet Perez, DC, Solo401. Um, all right, guys, let's get rocking here on this very rainy night in New York City. This is probably one of the rainiest years I've seen on record. Um, Hold on. I may have to transfer over to a backpack. This is one of these days. It feels like every time we're in New York, every other stream is a rain stream. And it's going to rain all the way through tonight into tomorrow. So tomorrow will probably be a rainy live stream too. It's been crazy this year with the rain. It's like nonstop. And the wind too. Doc7, what's going on? Welcome everybody. It's good to be back. Chris B, this is the Empire State Building is looking good tonight. It really is. Looks fantastic with the red, white, and blue. At least that's what it appears to look like. Maybe it's lit up in different colors for something else. Uh, Hal T, what's going on? Now the rain is not, this is probably the worst kind of rain because it's very, very light, but it's also windy. So it's kind of like you're just walking through a cloud of mist. Um, Kimberly says, which way are we going tonight? I think we're just gonna hang around Midtown. I was going to take you all to the Hudson Yards because there's so much new, fun, and exciting things going on over there. But it's gonna be, I mean, 30 mile an hour winds and rain again as it is every day. So we'll just hang around um, Midtown Manhattan. Maybe we'll go up 8th Avenue, We'll take a look at the new Pen2 project by Vernado. Alan says, glad YouTube is working again. Yeah, it was a little bit of a strange experience yesterday. The stream was uh, crashing, but you know, who knows? Maybe it was a hack. I think just servers were probably down. This is now on the corner of 8th Avenue. This is the main entrance where you can get the AC and E trains. And you're looking at the very back side of MSG, Madison Square Garden. Solo 401 says, I missed the skateboard. When's the last time you rode? Uh, I was riding the skateboard in Miami. You know, North Miami Beach. I very, very seldom ride in New York anymore just because I think it's too dangerous for an old man like me to be ripping around on the skateboard anymore. We'll see. Hey, check the logic, love the beach. Welcome everybody. Troy Atmans has actually loved the rain streams. It's a beautiful landscape, very relaxing. Thank you for doing it. No, I get it. Yeah, it's like a very nice ambiance. It really is. You know, New York City looks absolutely beautiful in the rain, but walking around in it for two hours, it's kind of laborious, kind of tedious, particularly if it, you do it every day. And it's just been raining like nonstop in New York. I think this is the second rainiest season in New York City. But it does look nice. You are right. Looks very pretty. Very busy though. Even though it's raining, very, very busy. You not only have car traffic, but you have food delivery, bike people traffic too. All right, we have the light. Let's cross. Look at the line of taxi cabs coming down here. Wait, taxi? Thirty fourth Street, Penn Station. I know, Sarah's talking about guys, what do you what do you think about all of that rain that they got in Dubai? I mean the airports, a lot of the videos that I was seeing on X formerly known as Twitter. It looked like an ocean. And many people are speculating it's due to their, what is it called, cloud harvesting that they're trying to do over there. This could be potentially changing the weather patterns in Dubai. 
I don't know about that, but I mean, the flooding was insane. It looked like brickle in uh, <laughs> when it's like a torrential downpour. That's kind of what Dubai looked like. It was insane. Um, now, if anybody's unfamiliar, brickle is in Miami. And almost any time you have very, very hammering and pouring rains, it's gonna flood. The streets of Brickle are gonna look like a river. And that's exactly what it looked like there. Oh yeah, Isaac, cloud seeding. You're correct. It's almost kind of unbelievable that they can do that in a way. Um, really, really crazy. I like this shot with all the taxi cabs lined up though. Now, I'm not too sure if we talked about this last night because we had some technical issues on the stream, but did anybody get a chance to look at what the Fed Chair Jerome Powell said about inflation? And it's funny because he's now kind of walking back what he's originally said, and now he's starting to sound like a lot of us when we talk about inflation almost every night in the live stream. Uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell yesterday spoke and he said, look, we're not seeing material progress on inflation coming down at all. Uh, and this was after the hotter than expected CPI report where CPI came in at three and a half percent. And the markets didn't like that at all. And you had a big sell off in the bond market. Love this shot of the post office. A lot of people don't know this, but this is still a post office in operation but it is also the Moynihan train hall too. This is a very, very classic New York shot here. This is right outside Madison Square Garden. So the, I should say, westernmost entrance. You come out of Pennsylvania Station or Penn Station by the Amtrak terminal. And then you have this awesome view with all the taxis and uh, Moynihan. Solo 401 says skimflation, pay more, get less, for sure. And shrinkflation, too. Wesley West, what's up? Kevy says, Tom, when are you coming back to Miami? You know, I really, really hope I can get back there uh, by the end of May. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, but wow, was I impressed by Miami? We, we sort of talked about this before, but every time I go down there, I'm just more and more and more impressed with the city. The people are amazing, the weather's fantastic, and there's also a lot of new construction going up too, which we've, we've covered. But, you know, a lot of that, I should say, new construction boom, you're starting to see a lot of that pick up in New York City now, um, regardless of what you see in the media. You know, we have some major, major, I should say breaking news. 350 Park Avenue. What's going on over here? Now, anyway, you guys need to look up some of the renderings here. It's called 350 Park Avenue, 350 Park. Citadel Securities' Ken Griffin just announced that he is going to move forward on that project. It's going to be in partnership with Steve Roth at Vernado and it's going to be a super tall on Park Avenue to compete with 270 Park, which is Jamie Dimon's new office tower, JP Morgan Chase, as well as 425 Park, which just so happens to be the temporary headquarters of Citadel. Um, so a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are happening, and I think that you're gonna to continue to see this migration from big Wall Street firms from Lower Manhattan to Midtown and Park Avenue between 42nd Street and 57th Street is really gonna be a utopia. I mean, it's gonna be amazing with all of these new Class A office towers. There's gonna to be about 6,500 Citadel employees. Um, so I have an interesting thesis and I'd like to know what you guys think. For all of those who've been watching this live stream, 
over the course of the last year. One of the places in New York that we've been talking about that's been trading in terms of residential, we're kind of shifting the conversation to residential real estate. One of the neighborhoods that we've been talking about that's really fallen out of fashion has been Sutton Place. I've taken you guys there many times. Uh, we've talked about the co-ops. We've talked about how the neighborhood is a little bit you know, further away, but now with the Second Avenue subway, there's a little bit more access. They built the new uh, East River Park. Now, with all of these new office towers going up very close to the Sutton Place neighborhood, these are really high paying jobs, right? If you're a quantitative at Citadel, chances are if you're working in Manhattan, I mean, you're probably making 500 plus, right? As a quantitative researcher or something like that. So people are gonna wanna live close to their office or maybe in and around. This could potentially be the resurgence of Sutton Place. Now, I know that may sound a little bit far-fetched, but neighborhoods are very cyclical in New York. Always, always, always very cyclical. Neighborhoods fall in and out of fashion all the time. Um, maybe this means Sutton Place will catch a little bit of a bit. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, but for now, speaking of Vernado, we are now walking the Hen 2 project, which is supposed to be the revitalization of the Penn District in and around Penn Station, which I'm also very excited about. Yeah, Dario, so Sutton Place is very cool. It's really, really cool. Um, I like it. A lot of people don't like it. They think it's a little bit too buttoned up, but look, maybe it'll come back into fashion. Maybe we'll have ticked the bottom in some place. We'll see. But yeah, I mean, check out some of those renderings. Again, if you want to see some of the renderings online, just type 350 Park Avenue and you can see it. It's going to be a state-of-the-art office tower. Um, and you also, you know, not to make the whole stream about real estate, but if you want to know another really cool kind of wonky yeah. building that's going up, uh, it's going to be right there on 8th Avenue by Restaurant Row. It's going to be by Gary Burnett and Extel. It's called The Torch. Now that building is unreal. A lot of people don't like it. I, I think we've talked about this before. Uh, let me see if I can show you a rendering. But this is the brand new entrance to New York City's Madison Square Garden. Look at this. This is all brand new overhang here. You have a new entrance to Penn Station right on 7th Avenue. If you look a little bit over to the right, you can now see the spire of one Vanderbilt. And they've completely taken down, or I should say they've torn down the Pennsylvania Hotel. Hey, Trade Brigade, what's up? This is Tom, how is Miami? It was awesome, man. You gotta come out. You gotta come out and visit us in Miami sometime. I think you'd absolutely love the city. And it was picture perfect weather the entire time I was there. Now look at this, everything is so open now. This used to be, you know, just being real. This used to be a lot of, you know, unfortunately a lot of homeless, a lot of drugs and things like that happening on this block. But now that they've elevated these ceilings and made it open, it really feels more inviting for just people to kind of congregate, maybe have lunch, um, and really just hang out, as opposed to hiding away, doing nefarious activities. Uh, and you also have a straight shot at the Empire State Building. This is the new entrance too. This is gonna take you all the way down to the New Jersey Transit section. So for any of our Jersey viewers, this is the new kind of escalator down into your terminal. Hey, Trade Brigade, thrilled to hear the weather was killer. Yeah, it was awesome. We started to get nice weather today in DC. Hopefully it stays that way, man. I mean, really, really hopefully it stays that way. It's raining again in New York. I think it's gonna rain all through tomorrow. Um, but yeah, it looks like we have our first correction here in the major markets. 
since we've uh, broken out into new all-time record highs. S&P 500 is solidly trading below its 50-day moving average, and the VIX is up. So we're getting a little bit of a bid in the VIX, and what I think we're gonna see this correction is change of leadership. And I posted about this on Twitter. Um, guys, Tesla's out of the question. I think Apple now is really out of the question too. I mean, these are trading well below the 50, uh, making lower highs and lower lows. Um, so look, I think you're gonna see newer leadership. And I think for the first time in quite some time, Samsung has now overtaken Apple as it relates to the amount of phone sales. Now, do I think it's the pending doom of Apple? No, but maybe you have new leaders taking over uh, and other leaders will be dethroned. And if you kind of study market history, uh, it's important that you understand sometimes the stocks that have been leading forever, you know, they don't lead anymore. And in the age of disruption that we're in right now, uh, I think it's fair game to say that anything could potentially be dethroned. So we'll watch Apple, uh, but really, really bad break of structure there. Uh, and Tesla's really been getting pounded, so maybe we'll have a relief, relief rally there soon. Uh, but indices are actually oversold, so we'll see. Looks like there must be a concert getting out here. Stance is Japan is betting on hybrid cars, not EVs. You know, Sam, we've had a lot of people in the chat talking about how hybrids are gonna be way more efficient than EVs. I'm not an expert in it, I'm not an engineer. I like EVs. I said if I were to get a car, I'd probably get a Tesla. But I definitely understand. Uh, it's, it's funny because pretty much every other major auto OEM besides Tesla loses a ridiculous, ungodly amount of money every time they sell an EV. I think it's something like Ford, every time they sell one of their EVs, they lose like $25,000. So it's not a profitable business. Uh, and that's why Tesla has kind of the advantage. So we'll see what happens. Old Wise Owls, the S&P 500 dropped under the 50 day as well. I saw on Bloomberg. Yeah, we, I think we have two distinct closes below the 50 now. MDs is Netflix on deck. I'm watching Netflix. Uh, Netflix has had a major, major turnaround story and earnings estimates for 24 and 25 are actually pretty good to be honest. Trade Brigades is looking for a weekly uh, higher low on the S&P. Uh, added to the long-term portfolio near today's lows, uh, 503 on the SPY. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because, well, number one, I think we need to put things in perspective. Um, this market, to Trade Brigade's point, if you look on a weekly time frame, it's been straight up in a straight line since October, right? We've been closing green on a weekly time frame every week since October, and markets go up and markets go down. Uh, and in bull markets, corrections across the board in major indices are usually around five to eight percent. Now, if you understand beta, right, which we talked about in the newsletter, if let's say if the S&P 500 corrects 10 percent, well, that means some of the more high beta stocks in the S&P or the Nasdaq, if the overall market's down 10 percent, some of those stocks could have a 30 percent correction, right? Uh, that's why it's important if you're in a lot of these leaders chances are, I mean, it's almost 100%, you have a lot of cushion here. Um, major moving averages are areas where you could either look for support, try to add for, to positions, uh, and hedge. But so far, right, as earnings season has kicked off, uh, financials actually been pretty good. And we spoke about this yesterday as YouTube was getting hacked and our stream crashed. Um, but for those of you who missed it, go ahead and go to the investor relations page of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, JP Morgan Chase, and Bank of America. And you'll notice a very, very distinct and clear trend of deal flow on Wall Street picking up. Goldman Sachs had its best quarter for investment banking revenue since 2021. And 2021 is when they had their most profitable year ever because of all the stimulus, 
and low interest rates. So we've been in, I would say, a bear market for deal flow on Wall Street, both M&A and IPO activity. And we've speculated that deal flow is gonna pick up. It seems that it has, and that is a positive thing. And in and of itself, oftentimes we can use price as a leading indicator. So for the last six months, you had a lot of the financial stocks trading at 52 week highs and all time record highs. What do we get in the earnings? Well, deal flow has been picking up and earnings exploded. I think Goldman Sachs uh, beat on the bottom line by over 20%, um, which is significant. Hey, hang with Mark Mom, what's up? Welcome back to New York City. We are now here on the corner of 34th Street and 7th Avenue. And you have the major Macy's, I should say the flagship Macy's right across the street. Abdullah, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. The Gord's is what's for dinner tonight. I'll recommend steak. Uh, I went to a good pizza shop in Long Beach, New York. For those of you unfamiliar with Long Beach, it's a town out east on Long Island. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the place, but it's very, very good. Ipadias is good evening, Tom. Good evening to you. RB says, you mentioned Ken Griffin Citadel moved to Miami, his ex-wife. Um, really? I didn't know that. I didn't even know Ken Griffin was divorced. Interesting. Uh, now, RB, we did mention uh, Citadel moving to Miami, but they're also expanding in a major, major way to New York City. 350 Park Avenue, 350 Park. Uh, Ken Griffin just announced that he is going to be moving forward with Steve Roth on plans to build a super tall tower on Park Avenue. That's going to bring over 5,000 Citadel employees. Those are high paying jobs, and I think the city is going to be rocking. Um, for the next five years. I think, I really do think that this is a trough in New York uh, and we're on the way up. Usually the news is the bleakest at the bottom. And if you've read any article about New York City over the last year, you'd think that it's Armageddon in the streets. Anyway, Kate says Tom Macy's in San Francisco is closing in 2025. You know, I also read a lot of the shops around Market Street, is it? I don't know. I'm not too familiar with San Francisco? Uh, maybe if we have any Californians or San Franciscans in the chat, what is the major, like what is the main drag there in San Francisco? Is it Marketplace or Market Street? Something like that? Anyway, but a lot of shops, a lot of stores, retail establishments have been forced to close in San Francisco due to the retail theft, unfortunately. That's the car, Live traffic stop. Yeah, trade brigades. This Macy's is trying to get bought out uh, by a PE firm to swap to real estate. I'm not too sure. What's going on with Macy's? Now, every time I think about these, uh, I just don't know if the business prop, uh, I just don't know if the business model is viable anymore due to the Amazon effect. Now, I'm gonna, me I'm gonna mention a very notable deal, which probably everybody's familiar with. Anybody remember when Bill Ackman tried to turn around JCPenney? I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Now, granted, I think it was a good idea, but it just didn't work out. I really do think brick and mortar is dead. My view is the following. Brands are going to continue to establish a more of an online presence, quite obviously, but they're gonna set up sort of like showrooms, right? So for example, whenever we walk down Park Avenue, we always see the Aston Martin showroom, we see the Ferrari showroom. I think more brands are gonna do these ritzy, glamorous showrooms and be very, very... 
and be very, very light on the inventory. So if you have a retail store like Macy's, there's so much inventory in here and oftentimes it just gets stolen. That's the reality of the fact. So this trend is probably gonna trend towards showrooms, showcasing your best pieces, drive traffic online, and that's when you can convert the sale because there's almost no theft online um, for obvious reasons. But, you know, the business of brick and mortar sucks in general because of online shopping and e-commerce. And now it sucks even more because in certain states and in certain cities, I mean, it's pretty, theft is pretty much decriminalized. You can just go and steal whatever you want now. All right, one more shot at the Empire. But if you guys are enjoying the live stream tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. We do these live streams every single night starting right around 8.30, 8.45. Uh, Matt's shouldn't be the reality. K4K, this makes perfect sense for the retailer. Uh, Ren 1018, this is Tom, San Francisco and New York City have similar issues. Both are gonna rip so hard in the coming years. I'd hope so, and I think so too. I tend to be uh, an over irrational optimist, but I'm seeing it. And to Arby's point, Right, not to kind of hammer on this point, but I want everybody to put this in perspective here. You see all the craziness on the news about the theft and about the crime, right? Both in New York City and Miami. I could say my piece on San Francisco, and we've said it before. Uh, I spent about a decade in tech. So I know a lot of people who work at some of the major companies in San Francisco, Salesforce and the like. And I also know a lot of startup founders and people who are working at startups the lion's share of them, okay, are still choosing San Francisco to start their AI startups. Not Miami, right, not Austin, Texas. To some extent, they're choosing Miami and Austin, Texas, but it's not even a comparison. And this is coming from somebody who owns property in Miami, so this benefits me. San Francisco still has the talent regardless of all the crazy political nonsense that's going on. So could you only imagine when all of this stuff gets fixed, which it will get fixed, and when San Francisco becomes safe and they fix all the crime and all the nonsense, like all the drugs on the street, the place is gonna, I mean, if you think, you know, if you think it's expensive now, which, you know, you could actually now get a quite a good deal in San Francisco if you buy an apartment there, I think if you buy in San Francisco now, if you're looking for like a con condo or something like that, I think you're gonna get very good returns over the next five to 10 years. I really do. I really think you'll get good returns. All right, this is the famous Macy's outside. Brawlic Cavs says, can talent move? Yeah, talent can certainly move. But, you know, the main thing that you should watch, in my view, is notable VC investment, right? And if you are in venture capital, uh, if you know someone who works in there, right, in that kind of realm, you're, like, you, you know where the money is. It's kind of like the old concept of follow the money, right? Let's actually go to Koreatown. I haven't been there in a long time. I gotta plug my phone in though. Uh, there is robust talent in San Francisco, despite all the nonsense. So when the nonsense goes, I think it's gonna rip. All right, I have to put you guys down for a minute.
Hey, Sharon is here. What's up? Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah, old wise owl. Old wise owl. This is David Rubenstein. Is where the money is. Uh, he has a really good kind of like podcast that's very very helpful. He's. Uh, I mean, when you think of private equity, that's who you should think of, right? This is looking all the way up 6th Avenue or Avenue of the Americas. And you can see Bank of America Tower. Hey, Trade Brigade, have a good night. We will see you soon. You can finally see leaves on the trees too. It's unbelievable. Uh, but we are gonna go check out Koreatown, which is 32nd Street. So Old Wise Owl, now that we're talking about private equity, there's a really good post on Twitter that I think you should check out. And uh, one of my friends, Jim, who runs a pretty successful firm on, on the street here in New York, he met, I'd say in February, he met with one of the biggest names in private equity. I won't say who, but hint, hint. And the biggest takeaway from the meeting, he said that a lot of the players in private equity are just so astonished by the amount of cash sitting on the sidelines. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because everybody in a downturn, and I think 2008 really, you know, made people have PTSD, like post-traumatic stress. And they think that every time the market goes into correction, it has to be a financial crisis. And everybody thinks they're the next, um, you know, everybody thinks that they have the next big short and that they're gonna, you know, pick up all the pieces when, you know, valuations go to zero, right? They think they're the next Michael Burry, if you will. But the fact of the matter right now is that we've came off about a decade of very, very ferocious and intense ZERP, zero interest rate policy. And that has made a lot of people an ungodly amount of money like a ridiculously sick amount of money. And everybody's looking at the same deals now. Everybody wants a discount, everybody wants a bargain. And everybody and their brother and their mother and their sister on Wall Street is looking to pick up the pieces and get good deals for pennies on the dollar. Problem is, if everybody is very well capitalized and if everybody has a lot of cash to deploy into the marketplace, well, what is the probability you're gonna to start to see valuations crater and tank and stay depressed if everybody is ready and willing to buy with cash on the sidelines? Now, I'm not saying that the market can't go down, right? We've been covering the commercial real estate really crash. That, that is a section of the market that is really uh, falling apart is some of this commercial stuff, mainly because we've fundamentally changed the way we work, but it's important to keep that in mind. You know, go look at the amount of money in money markets right now. It's about $6.5 trillion. So there's a, quite a bit of dry powder on the sidelines. All right, 32nd Street, Korea Way. Let's explore Koreatown. We'll walk to the other side of the street first.
Hey, Karina Thompson is here. What's up? Goldies, New York City must have planted thousands of daffodils. I mean, if you think this is a lot, just wait until we walk Park Avenue. Park Avenue quite literally must have hundreds of these planted for the spring. Travel Mista, what's up? Richie M. Thanks for joining. This is a good bubble tea place. Anybody like boba? Who here's a big fan of boba? This place is all right, Tiger Sugar. But if I had to recommend the best boba place in Koreatown, it'd probably be Gray Street, which is just across the street here. Hey, out and about. Welcome back to New York. Ren 1018 says boba has too much sugar for you. Some of the places don't have a lot of sugar. I'd say the more the more local places. If you go to the chain places, here, Gray Street's over here. Uh, they have a ton, a ton of sugar in it. But if you go to some of the local shops, like in Chinatown, it's not too bad. Old Wise Al says, Tom, I got a feeling the markets will take a breather over the next few quarters. Uh, it won't be any crazy crash event in your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I agree. Again, I always revert to the weekly chart of the S&P. We've been up in a straight line since October. Uh, this is the first pullback to the 50 day we've had since we came out of that handle in October. Uh, and a lot of leaders are extended and it's earnings season, so volatility is up. And in bull markets, you do have pullbacks, so. Matthew M says, why don't you allow pause anymore? I don't know what pause is. This is Gray Street. This place is good. I'd recommend getting a Dalgona coffee here. Very good. Peters is the sell in May go away syndrome. You can see a little bit of the spire of the Empire State Building. And then that's all the way back towards Penn Station. Hey, Action Kid, what's going on? Says Gray Street, your favorite. I'd probably say it's my favorite too. Uh, I usually get the Dalgona coffee with boba. That's like my go-to. But one thing I'll say, AK, about this place, I'm not too sure when the last time you've been here. Talk about crazy, crazy expensive now. I think if you just get like one regular drink there, it's like $7.50 like a Dalgona coffee with boba, it's like $7.50, maybe like $8 now. So things are things have gotten like wildly, wildly expensive. And I know we were talking about, you know, since you're traveling overseas, things are so cheap. You said that you can get a whole bowl of pho for like $3. Here, that's like $25 in New York. It's crazy. At some point, I don't know how much consumers can take because if you're going out eating in New York on a regular basis, I'd say at minimum, you're going to spend like $35. It's crazy. You know what? Speaking of another really good place in K-Town, 
action kit. I don't know if you've been here, but it's called Sorimara. You gotta check this place out. It's, um, so it's a Korean restaurant, but it's like a Chinese cuisine. It's the malatang soup. Very, very spicy, but that's probably the most expensive bowl of malatang you're ever gonna get. But it's very good, I'd recommend that place. Sorimara. Can make it. We got two seconds. Now, another new thing in Koreatown is this K barbecue spot closed down. And now it's something new. It's still a K barbecue spot, but it's no longer Baekjung. This is my favorite view of the Empire. Let's check the menu and look at the prices out of curiosity. Speaking about inflation, we just got that CPI print that came in at three and a half percent. And I definitely believe it, especially in major cities like New York and Miami. It's ridiculously expensive. It's probably the same pricing as Beckham. Right, the beef combo is 139. This seems very similar pricing to Beck Jog, does it not? What do you guys think? It's actually not too, too bad. Because these are like for groups. It's not one, the meals are not one person. I think it's like, you're supposed to eat it with a big group of people. But look at the inside now. They did a complete gut renovation. It looks great. Carl Roth's Tom, Miami, Florida only has 20 billionaires living there. That seems like a lot. I would I would have guessed a lot less. If somebody were to say, guess how many billionaires are living in Miami, I would have probably guessed half of that actually. Because a lot of people, they don't have their primary residences in Miami. They use it as a pied a terre. They'll live there for like six months. So 20 billionaires have their primary in Florida, in Miami, wow. I'm curious to see if that's, that number has grown over the last three years. I'm assuming it has. I guess it makes sense because there have been a lot of job growth. Now this is another really cool place. If you guys like speakeasy bars, this is kind of like that. Um, yeah, it's down here in the cellar really cool I'd say my favorite speakeasy place in the city uh, is Midtown East Tommy Jazz T-O-M-I Jazz it's really really good
Okay, Madison Avenue. What an amazing view of one Vanderbilt. Hey, SoCal Lawrence, yeah. You are the person who reminded me of the name of that joint. Someone says I hear Boston is good real estate. I was just in Boston not too long ago, uh, two weeks ago. Now, I know we have a lot of viewers from Boston, but I don't know. Uh, it's just not my thing. I just don't think the city's for me. I think if I'm going to be in the Northeast, I got to be in New York City. It's just, I don't know. Boston's too. I was walking around like their main Fifth Avenue, kind of what it is. I stayed at the uh, Fairmount Copley Hotel. It was nice. Don't get me wrong, it was very, very nice. But I just didn't feel that energy like you feel in New York. Does anybody agree with that, disagree with that? It's very, very difficult to compete with New York City, I think. Wow, Carl Roth says Tom Boston has eight billionaires living there. I believe New York City has the, the largest concentration of billionaires in the world, I believe. Andrew says you agree. And I'm not knocking Boston. I like the city. I think it's a beautiful city. But when you compare it to New York, it's, t it's really, really tough. It's really, it's really, really hard to compare to New York. But... Obviously, I have a bias. It's more historic, I felt, uh, Boston. Which I liked, but I also like the new, you know, one Vanderbilt, Central Park Tower, 157. Action Kids, as I agree with you on Boston, it's definitely focused more on education style of things, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you have Harvard, you know, it's, uh, yeah, like very studious. It's not, and again, I was only there for like 48 hours. So, I mean, who am I to even talk about this? But at least that was my takeaway. Says, you ever been to Pittsburgh? You know, it's funny you mentioned Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, because you know, Pittsburgh, if you're looking for, you know, if you're a newcomer, and I'd say if you know the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania real estate market really well, they've actually experienced quite a bit of population growth there because over the pandemic, there was a mini, mini king kindling of like a startup culture there. And you don't have to spend $5,000 in rent on a studio apartment. So if you're actually looking for a deal, like a duplex or a triplex, you can find good deals there. Uh, and you could rent to a younger populace that are just starting in their working careers. And I'm actually bullish on Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. One of my really good friends, one of my best friends, from Pittsburgh and he just he just bought another place uh, in Pittsburgh he lives here he works here um, he also works at a startup now his startups actually kind of interesting if anybody's familiar with the uh, hedge fund 0 0.72 that's Steve Cohen's hedge fund so two of their top traders uh, left Ooh, it's getting windy uh, broke off and created this company called Dalupa, D-A-L-O-O, -O, to automatically build financial models for you. So let's say if you're an equity research analyst or you're an associate or something like that at a bank or a hedge fund, you can use this plugin 
and it'll essentially scrape the data from the SEC's, uh, you know, SEC filings, like your 10Ks, your 10Qs, and it'll help you build, um, you know, your DCF models and things like that. It's an interesting product. I want to head up Madison Avenue, but it's going to be a wind tunnel up here. I want to show you guys the Morgan Library. You know, okay, out of all the United States, out of all the cities in the US right now, what do you think is the most underrated city in America right now? And when I mean underrated, I'm talking about like that has the most potential for growth that not a lot of people are talking about, but it's a great city. What would you say? The most underrated city in America. And, but maybe I'll hold back to see what you guys think first. This is now the corner of East 35th Street and Madison. Someone says Chicago. I knew there was going to be a ton of Chicago's. I don't agree, but Josh is my city, Austin, Texas. My good buddy just moved to Austin. Peters is Nashville, Tennessee. Loved Nashville when I was there. Wesley West is Sacramento, California. Troy Atmans is Tampa, Florida. Huntsville, Alabama. Little Rock, Arkansas. That's an interesting one. I'm curious as to why you say Little Rock. Bryant, St. Louis. Okay. I'm getting a lot of Nashville. I do agree. I like Nashville, Tennessee a lot. Vanderbilt. VLDs to Charlotte. Storm Riders is Denver. That was mine. That was my pick. My pick was Denver, Colorado. I thought I was going to see that pop up a lot more, but I think, in my opinion, the most underrated city is Denver. I really, really like Denver. Jacksonville, Florida. Never been. Daytona Girls is Daytona Beach, Florida. Charlotte, North Carolina. Corpus Christi, Texas. Yeah, you know, Denver has a big startup culture now too. Uh, a big tech culture. And it's sunny almost all the time. Anyone here for Den any anyone in the chat from Denver, Colorado? All right, here we have it. Now we're standing right outside of the Morgan Library. This is arguably one of my favorite places in the entire city. in between East 36th and East 37th Street on Madison Avenue. So if you're visiting New York City, check it out. Morgan Library. And a lot of the exhibits get traded back and forth between the Henry Clay Frick Museum. Yeah, someone says that Denver's landlocked. That's one of the main reasons why I chose to uh, move to Miami over Denver. That was one of the main choices. Denver's great, but I mean, for me, if you want to have, if you have a base already in New York, I think Miami is the second best place to be because it's two and a half hour flight. You're in New York City. And then two and a half hour flight, you're in tropical paradise uh, on the beach. And it's amazing. And there's a big finance infrastructure down there now and a big tech infrastructure. If the flight wasn't so long from New York to Denver, I think that's probably where I would be.
walk up a little bit more. But if you guys are enjoying the live stream so far tonight, feel free to leave a like on the video and click the subscribe button if you're new. We do these live streams almost every single night starting at 8.30. Ah, someone says Denver's a little bit too cold. That's true. It's not that I don't, it's not that I don't like the cold. Well, it's true. I don't like the cold, but it's when it's cold and gray and nasty is when I really, really hate it. At least it's sunny there. Oh, why is it also snowboarding in Wall Street? For sure. You know, anybody a big winter sports fan? I, I can't stand skiing or snowboarding. I don't know what it is. Uh, my brother is a major, major snowboarding fan. I can't stand it. I went a few times and I'm like, not for me. You're cold, you're wet. It's like just the worst combination on earth. Hey, Patrick NY, what's up? Good to see you. I'd rather be running in Miami. Or out boating or something like that. Ah, well, ice hockey, you could also play anywhere in the world, right? Kurtz is used to ski a lot when I was younger. Got it. I feel as if when you get older, you know, skiing and snowboarding becomes a lot less attractive because I mean, one one fall and I mean, you're, you know, snap your collarbone in half. I think the best low impact sports when you get older is probably tennis. It's great exercise and very, very low, well, relatively low injury risk. Assuming you're not trying to be a hero and pretend you're Roger Federer or something like that. Tennis is very, very low impact, low injury risk. The problem uh, that I've had because I've pretty much played soccer my entire life. I played soccer in college and it's destroyed my knees. Remember I went to the doctor one time and my doctor says I have very, very worn cartilage in my knee. And he's like, you should probably not run as much and do more low impact activities like swimming. And... Because training for soccer season, I used to do like, marathons a week like like it's nothing go out run 26 miles like it's nothing but over time that really crushes your knees yeah taxi cab pickleball is very good too true what about golf any big golfers here i want to get into golf but i'm Horrible at golf. Embarrassingly horrible. G. Raymond's bike riding is the best uh, no impact activity, and that's true too. This is Library Way. We spoke a lot about private equity tonight. Speaking of private equity, Steven Schwartzman building right here. Uh, 
Uh, Brad's is getting in the gym with me, Tom. I've been a gym rat forever. I used to hit the weights big time. Not really much anymore. Um, I mainly do like pull-ups and things like that. What is it called? Calisthenics? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But I do, like, especially when I'm in Miami. And that's another thing. I'm not sure maybe some New Yorkers could relate to this. I feel like it's a lot easier to get in a routine in Miami, Florida than it is in New York. Like in Miami, you know, I just take the scooter to the boardwalk, there's free pull-up bars, there's free gyms outside, and you can get a really good workout there. Here, it's like, you know, you gotta go to the gym and it's packed. And, you know, after work, there's like a thousand people in the gym and you gotta wait around. It's different down there. You can just crush pull-ups, pull-ups, push-ups, everything. All right, 42nd Street. All right, one of my favorite views in New York City, right here. You have Grand Central Station. Chrysler Building. Hey, Hawaii, what's going on? You're just in time. We're looking at Grand Central Station right now and one Vanderbilt. Headed towards Pershing Square. Mateo says how many pull-ups you could do. I usually do three sets of 12. This is Tom. Swimming is zero impact. Any sport with quick turn. Oops. Uh, with quick turn on a dime movements is prone towards injuries. Agreed. I love swimming. I wish I could swim a lot more than I do. Swimming is, is extremely, extremely good cardio. Right, we're here at Vanderbilt Avenue. We're looking at Pershing Square, Grand Central Station. And we're about to see 270 Park. Look at that. You can see the spire, 270 Park. This is also a really cool shot. You can see the eagle right on top of the main entrance to Grand Central. Now, when you stand directly under one Vanderbilt, it really gives you perspective of just how massive this thing is. Look at how crazy that is. It's 
go inside. Inside Grand Central Station. Now I filmed a walking video of the new Grand Central Madison Concourse. You can go check it out under our video section on our YouTube channel. It's extremely, extremely far underground. It feels like Grand Central is kind of quiet tonight, doesn't it? Good to see you, Combat Jones. And chief customers, for your safety and the safety of others, please do not sit on the floor or stairs at the Grand Central Terminal. Thank you for your cooperation. Line sinks is any idea how deep underground? I think 90 feet, but don't quote me on that. Maybe somebody could Google that. I believe Grand Central Station goes 90 feet underground. Hey, Phil's here. What's up, Phil? Welcome to Grand Central Station. Here we have a good shot of the greatest flag ever created. Good old American flag. This is the main clock. But you can still buy tickets to the Metro North right here. This is really a map of the tri-state area. You can see Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, and Long Island. Don't fall now, Watch Brooklyn and Queens are a part of Long Island. Train. You have Nassau and Suffolk County. This is where I'm from, right here. Right, right there. You have the good old MTA police officers with that very fierce looking German Shepherd. I once went to this uh, training facility where they actually train German Shepherds, police dogs and such. Those things are wild, man. I would not want to get chased or bitten by one of those. Chins is where's that? South Shore? Yes, correct. South Shore, Massapequa. Solo 401. You know, what's going on with golf, by the way? I know this new live thing. They're saying that this live is going to crush the PGA or something like that. I, I haven't really been following, I don't know too much about it, but Liv is what, the new Saudi Arabian golf league where they're throwing, you know, multi-millions of dollars at these golf players. Steve-O is 68 years old and lift weights four days a week. 
I've yet to have my first surgery, not bragging, and I feel blessed. You should brag about that, Steve-O. It's an amazing accomplishment. This is the Lexington Avenue Concourse. But we're gonna make a lap uh, back downtown. Uh, just a as a quick announcement for those of you who are just joining, I did send out um, our free investing newsletter on Thursday. And we talked about a lot of important topics, particularly as we head into this earnings season. We talked a lot about commodities. Um, they've been performing really well. And we talked a lot about inflation. So if you wanna receive our Substack every other Thursday, right as the market closes, you can just scan the QR code on your screen or type exclamation point news, N-E-W-S in the chat. Uh, and the Nightbot will drop the link to our Substack. We have about two years now of archived research. So if you like the talks that we have about the financial markets, uh, head over there, check out our research. We also have a podcast segment, which we record all of our newsletters. So if you're on the train and you're commuting, you can just listen to it. So check it out. All right, let's head out. We'll go back from the way we came. Actually, let's head out this way. This is where all the buses and the taxis line up. Man, look at this. This is like a beautiful great room. They sometimes have these um, squash tournaments here. Darren says you should take a taxi. Not a big taxi guy, not a big fan of taxis. Taxis are ridiculously expensive too. On the other side, you have a winery. Let's head back to Penn Station. Hey, Tariq Khan, what's up? Thanks for joining us. We have the 
Salesforce Tower in the distance. Harry Connor, is that really the theme song for Miami Vice? Wow, neighbor Bob's is Tom the Knicks and the Sixers start Saturday night in the playoffs. I'm not a big basketball guy, but I would say I want the New York Knicks for sure to win. Now, when I was in Miami, uh, there was a few Miami Heat games going on. I'm not too sure if the Heat are any good, but... Oh, everything in Miami says, yeah, it is. Okay, cool. Now, apparently there's, an, there's a video game coming out soon. GTA 6 which is supposed to drive a lot of traffic to Miami, I guess. Not a big video game guy, but supposedly it's supposed to be crazy earth shattering. Oscar Diaz, Tom, have you ever had have you had time to watch Champions League? I haven't. Now, wasn't uh, Real Madrid playing the other night or the other day, something like that? And I don't know. I'm not really. I used to be a crazy, crazy soccer fan. I used to play. I played all the way through college, but. Again, like I said, after the pandemic, I just kind of stopped following it. I watch a few like inner Miami games to watch Leo Messi. But besides that, I'd say not too, too much. Oh, cool, hang with Mark Mom. <laughs> played against Hunter College. That's on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It's a very good school. Got some construction workers doing their thing here. Yeah, Line Sync, I'll watch the World Cup totally. I think everybody watches the World Cup, even non-soccer fans. Love to watch the World Cup, for sure. Monty says, Tom, when are you back in Miami? Most likely the end of May. Probably right at the end of Memorial Day, I'll be back. I'm not gonna lie, this last trip to Miami probably made me miss the city the most, if I'm gonna be honest. The city is unbelievable. It was just it, it, indescribable, it's an awesome city. Hey Todd, thank you so much for your very generous $10 donation. Says I love this channel and the city. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for the support. We appreciate it very, very much. And thank you for joining the live stream. For those of you who are new here, we do these almost every day, starting right around 8.30, 8.45, most nights. But yeah, when I was down in Miami, I, I was able to take a lot of video. So I'll be posting a lot of Miami walking tours over the next week. I think my favorite one that I filmed was Wynwood. Love Wynwood, particularly at night. But also uh, Bay Harbor Islands. That's a fantastic place. Uh, Bay Harbor Islands is awesome. Bal Harbor. 
Yeah, South Florida is fantastic. This is 111, or I'd say 1114 Avenue of the Americas. Neighbor Bob's, Tom, do you drink coffee or anything with caffeine? Yeah, I'd say I drink probably too much coffee for sure, but that's the only drug I probably abuse is caffeine. Now, speaking of robotics and AI, remember we talked about the ghost kitchen at Sweetgreen? If you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. Sweetgreen is investing a lot of money into making these ghost kitchens or these fully autonomous restaurants. So you'll go in, you'll order everything on a kiosk and the robots will make your food for you essentially or make your salad and that's a that's a huge game changer for a multitude of reasons because at a lot of these qsr restaurants right these quick service restaurants one of the things they have is scale and scalability can be good and it can be bad because if you have slippage at one location you know multiply that over 400 locations and that's a lot of erosion to gross margin so imagine if you go to Chipotle, right? And the guy always gives you a little bit more chicken than he's supposed to. Imagine if everybody's doing that across all their stores. You know, you're gonna have a big ding to gross margin. But if a robot is giving the exact precise proportions every single time, could you imagine how much savings that is going to amount to across all of those locations? And that's what's so great about scale, right? Because if you're a huge enterprise, right? And you're doing, you know, for example, let's just say you're doing a billion dollars a year uh, in revenue. This is just a random number. And you increase operational efficiencies and it impacts 1% to revenue. That's a lot of money, right? So I think this uh, trend towards robotics, more streamlined operational efficiencies, not only is it gonna save on the food costs, but also the labor too. You know, one of the most uh, capital intensive parts of a business, at least QSR businesses, is the labor. Old Wise Al says we need robots to replace all cashiers. Now, I'm gonna say something that may be a little bit unpopular, but I don't know, as a convenience thing for me, it's true, I don't wanna speak for anybody else. I purposely will not shop at certain drugstores if they have real people ringing up uh, your stuff at the register. I just can't deal with them. I can't deal, I can't stand being around them. And I know it's horrible to say, I know it's terrible, but I'd rather just go in and grab my stuff and do the self-checkout and be out of there in two seconds. Um, that's just me. So there's some drugstores, I believe it's Dwayne Reed. They don't have any self-checkout, I won't shop there. I can't wait in line, I can't speak to these people. And I know it sounds horrible, I know it sounds terrible. I'm just being honest. Uh, I only will go into CVS, boom, 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 grab what I need and run out. It's bad enough that I have to wait for the customer service agent to unlock the plexiglass to buy, you know, a tube of toothpaste. I don't want to wait in the line and deal with somebody else. I just want to scan my stuff and be out of there in two seconds. I don't know. I feel as if I can ring my items up faster and more efficient than somebody else can. That's, that's kind of how I feel. And maybe that's being super impatient and ridiculous, which I agree, if that's what you're thinking. You may be thinking, dude, you're so impatient and you're ridiculous. I agree. I totally am in agreement with you. But I think New York conditions you to be like that.
Now there's also data behind this. And this was really pioneered by Amazon and Jeff Bezos. There's a really good interview, really good uh, interview with Jeff Bezos about how they spent some, all this money to do a study on friction in a transaction. And that's why if you noticed on Amazon now, there's buy, a buy now button. So they did a study and the more steps that you put in between a customer and the final sale, the every single step with every single passing step, the probability of them abandoning the cart and not going through the transaction goes up 50%. So by the time you hit three steps, you're not gonna buy something. And I think it's the same thing in brick and mortar. You know, if you walk into a drugstore and you and you see the line, you're like, oh my God, this line is so long. You're just not gonna go shop there, right? You'll probably order it off, off Amazon. So now, you know, if you have an Amazon account, you preload your credit card, you preload all of your information, and you just click one button. There's no confirmation. You literally just shop and tap with one button and it's at your house in 48 hours. So even as a small business owner, I think it's important for people to realize that if you have a small business, try to audit your processes from what it takes from when you first come in contact with the customer to closing. And you need to do everything you can to reduce the amount of friction in transactions. And Amazon has done that in a really, really amazing way. And I think self-checkout has done that uh, in an amazing way too. <laughs> Patricia says, really? Tom, that's common sense. You'd be surprised. I mean, a lot of, most companies didn't do that. And most brick and mortar are out of business. I mean, the only reason why Best Buy is around is because Best Buy actually doubled down on e-commerce and Circuit City didn't. Circuit City is, is bankrupt. Yeah, someone's talking about those Amazon Go stores where you just walk in, you pick it, pick up your items, and you just walk out. Yeah, that's even less friction, right? So you walk in with your phone, it knows your Amazon account, and it knows every single item you walked out and just automatically bills your account. That's a really good uh, example. Peter says, look at Sears and Kmart. That's another good example. I think at one point, this might have been Kmart, it might not have been, so don't quote me on it. They tried to make a partnership with Amazon for a return center. So in hopes that when people would come to return their Amazon products, they might buy something at the store. This is Joe's Pizza, which we now have a location in Wynwood, Miami. Gary Carpenter says Target is getting rid of self-checkout. Are they really? That's a bummer. I go to Target a lot for the reason because they have uh, self-checkout. That's the whole reason why I go there. Look at this. Troy Atmans, Tom, what if you were a mother or father shopping for a big family? Would you still want self-checkout or somebody to bag your groceries for you? I think me personally, I would still want self-checkout. Maybe that just caters to my personality. 
but I just like to head in, get what I want, pay for it, and be out of there. This thing is actually kind of unique. Wow, Night Owls, the Walmart near us is getting rid of self-checkout too. Uh, cops are always there for theft. Wow. What state is that in? Now, is that a problem with the self-checkout or is that a problem with the legal expectations that we're setting as states and as a country. It's kind of like uh, broken windows theory, right? Now, unfortunately, all of this retail theft that everybody's talking about in the chats, it's really just hurting the lower class, the poorer class, and really kind of maybe not so much, but middle class communities. It's really not impacting the rich at all. And I've, I've always made this statement, you know, anything that the government uh, tries to do to help Poor people, low-income people, all of their policies actually just make things harder. Because all the majority of these stores that are getting looted and things like that, they tend to be in not the best neighborhoods. And then when they're looted to the point where they need to go out of business, well then normal hardworking people in those communities, they don't have a place to shop anymore. And now they have to go two or three miles uh, to go shopping. So the soft on crime policies, it doesn't really impact people with a lot of money. And I think this is what politicians need to understand. It impacts the people who can't afford to be hurt. Uh, and that's low income communities. You know, if all this craziness that's going on in the subways, if you're rich, you're like, meh, I'll just spend $40 on an Uber. Don't care. I'll avoid the subways altogether. Well, if you are, you know, making $50,000 a year living in New York City, you're forced to take the train. Well, that's going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt the rich guy. They'll just call their chauffeur or take an Uber. If your target goes out of business in East Harlem, you know, do you think that's going to hurt somebody living on Billionaire's Row? No, they have, they have people to go shopping for them. They don't go shopping themselves. So it hurts, unfortunately, uh, those communities. So I think the government's doing a really, really bad disservice to them. We are almost back. Two thirty fourth Street. Hey. All right, everybody. I think we'll call it a night here. It's getting late. We started this stream about an hour late. Uh, but we will be back right here tomorrow at 8.30. So if you enjoyed the stream, feel free to leave a like on the video. Click the subscribe button if you're new. And we will see you all right back here tomorrow on Walks on Wall Street. If you want to sign up for our free investing newsletter, you can scan the QR code on your screen, punch in your email, and it'll bring you to our Substack. Uh, we write all of our thoughts on the financial markets and send them out to the chat every other Thursday. So I will see you guys 